Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. It's me, Flake, and I'm joined again by Rick from BCW. My friend, how are you today? I am doing absolutely wonderful. Sorry about the background. Sorry about the uh, microphone in the screen this time. Uh, I'm not normally as cool as you with that, but unfortunately, I'm at a large convention uh, here in Reno, Nevada. And uh, so I'm busy. I'm tired, but I'm doing wonderful. Thanks for having me back. Oh, it's always great. I mean, uh, it was a great time last time. We brought you the finals from, uh, I believe it was Harry Tarantula, which was an awesome, awesome, uh, wonderful event. And here we are again bringing you the ProQuest finals, this time from Manta Gaming that took place this past weekend. And it is another awesome matchup. No surprises here. It's going to be Viscerai versus Starvo. But uh, this one has a little bit of a familiarity in terms of the heroes, but also a returning challenger. As last time we brought you some matchups, it was Derek Chu on Viscerai. Didn't quite get there. And this time he'll be taking on Raymond Chow, who already has one ProQuest win under his belt. My nemesis, Raymond Chow. And there's some stories to be had there. I'll get into them a little bit later. But Rick, why don't we start with the deck lists and see what both players are bringing to the party. We'll start with Derek Chu again, returning challenger Derek Chu on Viscerai. Why don't you walk us through this list here? All right, well, this, look, this list looks very familiar to what we actually saw on the last video we did. So we've got, as far as the equipment, we've got the skull cap, we've got the Skeleta, we're running the Crown of Dichotomy. Typically, that's coming in for Arcane Barrier 1. We've got Grasp of the Arcanite, Spellbound Creepers, Vexing Quell Hand, and the Rosetta Thorn. Total of seven equipment. We get down here, it's, again, it's really this hybrid Viscerai. Uh, it mostly is going to slant to an aggressive package, but we are still seeing the three uh, yellow wreath runes. We are seeing the three red read the runes and we're also seeing uh the rune blood incantation in red in three so those are going to help with the non-attack actions producing rune chance uh, other than that a nice shout out again once again to the uh shrill of skull form uh we're seeing that in the blue slot that's a phenomenal card and now really uh, a, a staple in the viscerai decks when you look at the red cards and what's really pushing this aggressive package uh, I am a huge fan of seeing things like Swarming Gloomvale, which is just absolutely an amazing, an amazing card, uh, and Revel in Runeblood. Both of those cards out of Everfast, uh, you can see 20 damage turns without an OTK. So absolutely love seeing them in this deck. Yeah, I mean, Everfest has really been essentially just uh determining the climate of what the meta is looking like the cards themselves have been very high powered high tempo uh and then there's the hero that came from everfest that would be what raymond chow is representing here in this matchup it is going to be bravo star of the show raymond chow again has already won a pro quest this is his second go here in the finals a wonderful wonderful uh, wonderful competitor again i say my nemesis see we have had quite the matchups in our history and most recently i did uh beat him at red riot games in our first matchup it had to be raymond chow in the first round uh but uh, he did knock me out of the top eight at harry tarantula and uh, which he ended up winning, I believe. No, that was not him. That was Isaac Crute. That's my bad. But Raymond Chow does have one under his belt. And bringing Bravo Star of the Show again, like we mentioned, the meta essentially is this Triangle of Doom. And here are two of those corners of this uh, of this triangle. So walk us through here a little bit of the Bravo Star of the Show list. I know that a lot of people have already essentially figured out what the main package is here. But there are some spicy elements to this particular recipe that Raymond's bringing. Well, there are a lot of uh, little flavor touches in this, as well as some new Prism hate. Now, that's really the 27 Aura Package Prism deck is not what we're talking about, but it was really preying on Bravos that were showing up not prepared for it. So when you quickly just look at this deck, you see the Arcane Lantern, that's really just Arcane Barrier. You're really only going to see that brought in against Kano, which has actually started to show up some. Uh, we've got the Crater Fist, the Crown of Seeds, the Fendel Spring Tunics. Now we're running the Ironhide Legs. I'm guessing that is for the Mirror Match. Uh, we have the Null Room Boots. We have the Rampart of the Ram's Head, Time Skippers, and Winter's Whale. Now, one thing that's missing here is the Bastion of Eisenloft. I really think that that um, has a key um, piece of equipment for some matchups, but 
Normally, the Ram parts of the Ram head is going to put in a lot of good work as well, especially when you see the Crown of Seeds being activated. By pitching a blue, you're floating two resources. One of them is going typically to that Ram parts of the Ram head, so you're going to reduce a lot of the damage that you're taking. So I'm fine with this uh, equipment. I like it a lot. It seems to do exceptionally well. You get into the uh, the, the elements and you get into the, um, I, the the autumn's touches and breakdowns and things like that. Well, we're going to see a lot of those going to be in the red. A little different in this list, we're seeing three yellow autumn touches. Uh, normally, that's not something that I've personally witnessed, but it does help with that uh, higher damage. Uh, we're actually seeing the autumn touch uh, across the board. We're seeing three red, three yellow, three blue. Autumn's touch blocks three. And I think that's why it is taking place of the bright ground and the evergreen uh, being able to play the three yellows. It's just giving you more cards that you can effectively block with uh, in the mirror match when you have to block out a frosty winner's whale. Uh, a couple other really spicy pieces real quick. We've got the red lightning surge in here. Uh, that is a card played for Marshall. I'm going to have go again. It's a zero for four. So it's not going to use Bravo's triggered ability. So one thing that we could look for them to do is to trigger Bravo's ability, have that in the arsenal, and be able to play that, come in for four with go again because of what the lightning surge can do, and then after that, play one of the three powered attacks that's going to get dominate plus two and go again, and then be able to come in with the winner's whale. So a nice way to come in with three attacks, apply a lot of pressure in one turn. We're seeing that. We're seeing the staunch response as the default uh, defense reaction for the Bravo mirror. Uh, and then we go over here to the blues. We're seeing the awakenings. We're seeing the blanks and the blizzards like normal. But we're also seeing two exposed to the elements. Now, last time we talked about this, I think it was a one of in the list that we covered. This can play a really big role in the Viscerai matchup, especially if you're able to get the Scaleta with an exposed to elements because you can stop them from being able to gain the benefit of reducing the cost of their non-attack and their attack action by being able to destroy it. So I'm wondering if that is going to be the play here in this matchup. Super excited to get to the matchup and see it. The rest of the deck, again, looks very familiar and very similar to the decks that we've covered in the past with Bravo Star of the Show. Yeah, he is definitely the star of the show. He is eating up all of the meta, and he is on his way to living legend status, having lapped Chain already. Rick, it has been like six weeks, and Chain is already old news. Can you believe it? But uh, uh, we'll see what happens. There's going to be a calling coming down the line here in Indianapolis, and the Pro Tour, that is another big litmus test to how this, you know, just the sheer power level of this hero. So... Off we go now to the game itself, ladies and gentlemen. Again, this is the ProQuest Finals from Manta Gaming that occurred this past weekend in Toronto, Canada. My hometown. So we're going to check out this matchup again. Derek Chu on Viserai versus Raymond Chow on Starvo. All right, here it is. Both players are now ready to go. You can see the life counters both at 40. That is Raymond Chow on the left with Starvo. Derek Chu representing Visarai. They're presenting their decks. Get those last cuts in wherever you can. And, uh, yeah, the equipment's ready to go. And I, if I'm not mistaken, I believe it was Raymond Chow who goes first in this matchup. Again, a wonderful player. Just a, a, a great, great person. But don't let him hear that I said that because he is still my nemesis and what you were talking about earlier there rick about the double exposed elements i mean that is really uh, a, a very big point of debate amongst a lot of competitive players discussing you know is it worth it to throw in there i know it's a long shot but in reality against viscerai if you can go ahead and snipe that skeleta it is a game winning play as in this this particular matchup, Rick, I think we're going to be seeing Viserai going for that OTK strat, just piling up the rune chats and then just coming in like an atomic bomb. All right, well, here we go. We started, and hey, turn one, got it, show it, here it goes. We have a dominated uh, plus two evergreen coming in, um, and this is going to be met with a block three. Yeah, and right away, I mean, this is just hot and heavy right out of the box here, man. I mean, as you can see, this is what Starva wants to do, and it's all 
Very clean cut. You pitch the lightning, you throw the big green at them, and then you swing with ice hammer to make things awkward. And uh, in reality, uh, you know, for, for Derek Chu here, he he's seen this before. He played against Isaac Krut just a couple weeks ago in a finals at Harry Tarantula and did not make it through, unfortunately, as Isaac Krut, great player, did get to convert. There's an ice, a little frostbite there for right. Visceride. Not a, not a bad start here for Raymond Chow. All right, so we're going to see a big pitch. Uh, it looks like uh, we're going to be floating some number of resource. It's uh, uh, well, it you, two, so he's got two floating. So we're going to see a whisper come in and just kind of set the top of the deck for the draw phase with no arsenal. Um, one on top, one on bottom, and it looks like we're still floating the uh, resource. And uh, right away, just go ahead, pitch tunic, get that cycle going. I mean, right yep. now. Uh, what Raymond's looking to do is essentially with that crown ability is you're going to be recycling your arsenal here to try to go ahead and just find that that beautiful that Triforce of powers, you know, summon Captain Planet, as it were. If you get all all three of the Infinity Stones, you can go just go ham on your opponent. And in this case, it's a little bit of a race as uh, Starvo needs to start applying pressure, finding those big, big pieces, you know, finding the Oak and Olds, fusing them, finding the Crippling Crushes, fusing them, being able to not just apply damage, apply pressure, but just steal some cards from your opponent's hand, just sort of limit and handcuff them a bit in terms of what they're able to do. Right. There's an exposed element. With a, fuse. with a fuse for both Earth and Frost. Well, potentially, we're debating on the Frost. They're thinking here, this is one of those big plays. Having that exposed elements early can sometimes feel awkward, but he's going to go ahead and start putting pressure on that Skeleta. And the thing about yep. this is, we mentioned, he is running too. So should Raymond find the second one, that Skeleta is really... That could be game. If you can go ahead and snipe that, find the second uh, exposed to elements, and just take that Skeleta out of the game early, this could be incredibly difficult for Derek Chu to rebound from. Well, I mean, uh, Chu, Derek is just going to have to switch to the aggressive plane if that happens. Um, it does kind of mitigate some of the damage they could do on building up for that big turn. Uh, I was kind of surprised that we... Uh, that, that, that we're now just seeing a frosty hammer come in, uh, another full block out, an arsenal. So it did cost a little bit of pressure, I'm going to assume, by playing it, but I think it was the right call because now the Skeleta cannot be used to be blocked with. We see another grasp of the Arcanine activation going to take us up to two rune chance and... Just simply, I mean, the, these right. Viscerai turns, oftentimes, Rick, they, it just feels like it's just... Build up that that sandcastle, that 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 house of cards, as it were, with the rune chance, right? And you want to be be able to pile as much damage into that little pocket before you come at Starvo. But in the meantime, Starvo's just. You can be patient. One thing that I've learned when you're playing Starvo against Viscerai, oftentimes you do feel the the the, the pressure of being of, of needing to apply damage, needing to apply pressure, but you can be greedy by holding pulses. You can be greedy by not necessarily carrying an arsenal if your hand is very. Uh, you know, fuse worthy. If you're holding the right cards to do it, then you're just looking for those big punches, right? Those big swings, the the oak and old, the crippling crush to really punish your opponent. Just coming in with a hammer here for Raymond. Yeah, it's frosty. It, it is a frosty hammer. But it doesn't seem like it's enough, right? Because you can get away with a, a, an easy block. And the thing about Viscerai here as well, Rick, is that equipment can really soak a lot of damage. Okay, so here we go. We've got a blink off of that into a attack for four. One damage is going to bleed through. Um, so, but you're you're also stripping Viscerai's hand. So that 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 frost is a problem. Okay, so now we're just going to get the red read the runes, which is going to create three more. So we're going to be up to five rune chance and a pass. So now this is the game plan that Viscerai wants to do. However, it is at times the appropriate thing, in my opinion, to just continue to apply what pressure you can. The hand didn't shape up. There was no big attack from Starvo in their hand through the Crown of Seeds activation. So we're just pitching, coming in with four. We're making the best out of it we can. Uh, we're now going to see another Starvo activation. So there it, is. there it is. And we're going to see a break ground come in. Now that break ground is going to come in with that dominate plus two and go again. Looks so like we're a... going to see more damage come through. 
Is that the yellow, if I'm trying to think, or is it the red? Um, nonetheless, it's damage that's dominated with a go again on top of it. And one thing that I've noticed from uh, Raymond's list is there are, like you mentioned, those yellow earth cards. And you're putting those yellow earth cards perhaps in place of maybe another uh, red evergreen or perhaps putting another spi uh, you know, another spinal crush or some of those tech cards. But it seems like Raymond's just favoring the fact that, you know what, I'd rather have the yellow than the blue in this case to push through damage. And that's what's going on right. here. Having the extra earth cards as well and pr uh, pressuring is the life totals now. It's 40 for Raymond to 27. And in these matchups, Rick, I mean, I've played so many of these matchups, and it's not a comfortable feeling when you're at 40 and they're sub 10, you know, at single digits, when they're stacking those those rune chants with the Skeleta just waiting to pop. Right, and that's what we're seeing so far. We just saw a red read the runes into a pass the turn where we're going to see a crown of seeds activated on the end of the turn. Uh, so we're really trying to still sculpt the hand. Uh, and we're going to see an Art of War at the end of turn with the floating resource from that pitched Autumn's Touch, a Banish, and a Draw 2. And I'm going to, the other mode doesn't matter. You still have to declare one, though. So you're going to see, like, being able to play cards uh, defensively from your arsenal or plus one attack, plus one defense. Um, because this is all happening on the end of his opponent's turn. Um, we're already at nine rune chance, which is something to be mindful of. Really, I've seen the Viscerite list at 10 to 12 rune chants be able to have some incredible turns and put Bravo on the back foot. Uh, it, it's amazing. Before, you'd want to get to 22 to 30. And uh, it looks like we missed on the Bravo activation, even with the Art of War and the Crown of Seeds activation. So we have another break ground coming in. This one does not have go again currently. And I only say currently because the card does the deck does run cards like Blink. So, uh, but I seen that flash discarded um, or pitched rather makes me wonder what's in the hand. There's the There's first unmovable of three that I'm, uh, I'm I'm certain are being packed in there again. Defense is in, in very imperative in terms of how this uh, Viscerai list wants to survive before it, it can accumulate enough of those rune chants, and um, you know. In in these cases, you know, where are you? Where is the 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 that sort of Goldilocks zone with the rune chance, Rick? Where the you're looking as the vis to start clapping back? Well, I mean, really, honestly, twelve plus. But your life total is really the the, the key factor. And right now, we're seeing a dominated oak and old fused coming in. So that's eleven with go again on hip, but two cards from hand to the bottom of your arsenal now. That exposed elements earlier on is not going to stop the Skeleta from being able to block, so we're only going to be able to block three. And, oh, then we come out of the arsenal with an unmovable. I'm going to guess that that is going to put us up to the that, 11. And that's 11. And now, we're going to, yep, and now we're going to see the Evergreen come in with that second attack, and I like that because we're applying pressure, trying to strip cards out of Viscerai's hand, which you need to do. So this is just coming in for, if it's a red, which it looks like it is, uh, it's coming in for seven. And what's fascinating, I asked Raymond uh, ahead of this uh, this broadcast here, you said, you know, looking at the list and wondering, I said, you're, you're, you're rocking the art of wars, and I'm just curious, uh, you know, what the, the mentality is here in terms of perhaps diluting some of that elemental uh, reliability of what your deck list is. And what he has said to me is he told me, he's like, you know what? The art of war is a very versatile thing. I can pair it up with your tunic to get extra cards in your hand. And really, if you're seeing six or seven cards in a turn, you could be very well, damn well sure that you're probably going to be able to fuse. So using it after your opponent's turn to beef up the de defense if necessary, but ultimately drawing up those cards, getting those extra uh, pieces in your hand to really uh, essentially almost guarantee the fuse. So he has, uh, we, and then we've seen it there. He played the Art of War a, a, a turn or two ago, drew a, a bunch of cards, and what came back, it was an Okanol that was double fused and jammed right in Derek's face. And um, the, the life totals, as we've seen in these matchups, it's going to be all Starvo all day long, but eventually... Viscerai is going to just explode and you're you're like you mentioned you want to basically pair it up with um, that perfect storm of a lot of uh, rune chants and a sonata so sonata really is the most important piece to that that comeback story right yeah you you have you have to have the sonata now the block there with the swarming gloom veil I, I'm wondering if we're not getting ready to 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 see that because now that is a card I don't mind blocking with because of cards um uh oh my mind just left me i'm so sorry um 
rattle bones because of rattle bones it gives you a, a phenomenal target for rattle bones being able to spin two and then play that card banish from your discard pile and it has go again and odds are it's going to be creating the rune channel you've already created rune chance um there's a lot of this debate right now with the cards in hand on blocking that frosty hammer coming in um it looks like we're going to just see a rune flash block it and no oh, and we're also going to see now we're up to 10 so we're seeing the defense reaction on it as well um so we're not going off next turn i don't believe but we are up to 10 and i'm really enjoying this match this is absolutely phenomenal they are playing relatively quick the life total is now 40 to 14 so we're getting to that window where we've got to find the sonata if her viscera to go off and and have a chance in in my opinion uh i'm gonna say maybe maybe a turn maybe two yeah, uh, because you're gambling every time you pass uh, that they can't starve and dominate and come in with another attack. That's right. You got to have a little bit of a cushion here. Now, when I said that, you know, what's the ideal number? Sometimes that ideal number is more so inclined to what your health total is, because you cannot. Eventually, you're going to have to swing back. And uh, right. and I, I there was a match I played uh, at the ProQuest at uh, Red Riot where essentially I had my opponent. It was 40 to one. And that game ended one nothing for me, and it was uh, uh, incredible in terms of what the the sort of the damage output that could occur as a viscerai player when they need to. It's you're basically backing up this rabid animal into a corner, and they're going to lash out. So the more and more you surround them, and the more and more you corner them, they are going to get vicious. And uh, that's basically what Derek Chu is evaluating here: is how much can he take before he eventually has to pop off? But you got to have the rune chance, you got to have the skeleta, and you have to have the sonata. That is the major, major piece to coming back in this matchup because really the story of 40 to 14 is not the that's not the real story here the real story here is how far can raymond push Derek before he pounces right and we're, we're down to eight we're down to eight so now every attack is presenting potential lethal we've got a frosty hammer coming in for four we see a quick block now those are cards that really he'd want to play because that was a mordred tide uh, that was a uh, Mobber Skies and a Rattle Bones. Um, we're in survival mode because of the life total. Uh, we're, we're digging for a Sonata, and uh, I, I really think that's that's what we're digging for at this point in time with the blocking and passing. So we've seen the pass. We've got another Starville activation. This could be, depending on what's coming out, this could be lights out. It looks, like a, it looks like a Heaven's Claws that he held in his hand over here, so it's just merely going to be another Autumn's Touch. But again, vanilla damage when you're it, you, when you're in that single-digit range can be scary. It's not a Crippling Crush. We haven't seen one of those. We've seen one Oakenold. But ultimately, if you're Raymond here and you're looking at the score sheet and then you're looking at the Rune Chant count, this is a very, very, very comfortable position for him because even if his Sonata is perfect, he still has a massive cushion of 40-some-odd life or 40 life to just absorb and come back. So uh, in, in these situations on the Viscerai end, you're really wanting your, your Rune Chant total to be 15, 16, approaching 20 even if things are going well. Unfortunately for Derek, he just hasn't seemed to have, the, have uh, you know all the traction going here. And all right. All right, well, we're go I, I'm going to say it right now. We're going. We kept three cards in the hand, one in the arsenal, and this is the first time we're seeing the equipment blocked. Now, the equipment hasn't been used beforehand, and it blocked at the perfect time to stop that Frosty. So you blocked the four damage. You're at three live total. Uh, I'm going to guess that we're going to see that Skeleta pop. Uh, there's the Mordred Tide. Key piece, like we mentioned. There it is. There it is. There it is. That That is the Become the Arknight. That's going to create two rune chants. Now we're going to go get the Sonata Arcanist. We're going to be able to pop the Sonata. Once you pop that Sonata, you're going to get a discount on that. Um, or once you pop the Skeletor, you're going to get a discount. You're going to be able to see nine cards off that Sonata because you're going to be able to pay six twice. Uh, so this is, this is the grip we're waiting for. And the fireworks show is about to begin. Plus, we have a card that's been in the arsenal for a very long time. And I'm going to guess that that is going to be a non-attack action card that is going to have the ability to give go again, if I'm guessing. Uh, just because we also have the boots as a potential option, because we need to go as wide as possible. 
Here it comes again. It's a double X payment, but with the Skeletta, which uh, he's there. There he goes. It's uh, it's happening. They're talking about it. There it goes. So there's the Skeletta coming through. We're going to use that ability to basically reduce the cost of one non-attack and one attack by the amount of rune chance. And that would be 12. So XX plus three cards. That's going to be six cards. Again, 12. Uh, you get a discount of 12. So six on each X plus the three cards. It's nine he's flipping over, so a potential right. of four. If everything goes well here, you flip four and five, you're going to pick up four attack action cards in your hand, and I mean, you want go-agains in this case. You want to pick up your Swarming Gloom Veils, but he's been blocking with them. You can see right in the graveyard right there, the top card is a Swarming Gloom Veil. He, so just, pitched, he just pitched that for the Become the Arknight. Uh, right now, we are... There's a Swarming Gloom Veil in there as well. So we're getting a four. We are getting the four. Perfect, perfect. Four non-attacks, four attack actions, one defense reaction. Those four are going to go to his hand. He has the one card in Arsenal. Everything is going to get shuffled back in. The Sonata is going to be banished, but it's going to come in with a four Arcane. Now, mind you, there's not been any damage done to Bravo Star of the show yet. So Bravo's sitting at 40. He can just take it. But there is a meet and greet, I believe, in the stack of uh, attack actions he's going to be able to pick up. I can't quite make it out because of the glare. But if there's a meet and greet in there. He may be. I see a Dread Triptych. I see the Swarming Gloom Veil. I can't make out the second card. I think the other one is the Shrill of Skull Form. So if that's a meet and greet, that's the second card, then we're looking at the need to block out all the arcane damage. Otherwise, that card's going to get the go again. But you also have, right now, 14 rune chance coming in. So meet and greet would have go again. Yeah, you want the stars to align in this case if you want a shot at this if you're Derek. Again, 40 to 3 is a very, very big uh, deficit to overcome, but this is what this turn is for. So when you're the first order of business, I want to maximize the Sonata, which, which he did. So four attack actions. Next thing you want to do, you want to find go-agains in there. You want to make this turn last, especially when you started this off with a Mordred Tide. So Mordred Tide is basically just going to go ahead and add more juice to every oh. attack. Oh, I love this play. Sorry, I don't mean to cut you off here, but so we're starting with the Dread Triptych. The Dread Triptych has text on it. So if you have played a non-attack action, you get to create a rune chant. You're under Mordred Tide. That's going to create two. Visrise ability is going to create two because you're playing another rune blade card. And if you've dealt arcane damage, which you've dealt off the Sonata, that's going to create two more rune chants because of the Mordred Tide. So you have six. If it hits, it's going to create two more rune chants. It's coming in for four physical damage right now and 14 arcane damage on rune chance we have that face down card i'm gonna again i still say that's got to be a non-attack action with go with the ability to give go again and if that is the case we are the, the fireworks are about to pop off because you've got that swarming gloom veil uh you have a spell blade assault it looks like blue and you have the uh shrill of the skull form which is also blue so we this is just going to be a massive swing uh, of damage. The Bravo players already taken the 14 rune chance down to 22. So we've dealt 16 arcane damage this turn before any physical damage has been dealt. And not only that, but he's very, very adept in terms of how he blocked with the crown. He's, a lot of players will just panic and crown immediately, and that'll absorb an arcane. But you want to prevent the on hit from this attack, and the attack at that break point of four. So you're going to give him a crippling crush at three, and timing that... Uh, crown correctly will absorb the extra one. So that on hit of the Dread Triptych, which was threatening, I believe, another two plus the one from Mordor Tide, right? For three no, extra... No, thre it, no, it was threatening one plus the Mordor Tide, which would have made it two. Right, I sorry. Apologize. I was just combining them together. Yeah, so the two of uh, of there is... So this block here, that crown, in reality, is, is essentially saving you three. So the value of the timing here is very imperative as, uh, again, experienced players will know the right times to use that crown versus whenever, uh, you know, wherever else. Okay, now we did see the pitch. I cannot make out that card. Now, the little it, lighting at the, the this was a this was going out down at a at a hotel in uh, in Toronto. So sometimes the uh, the the lights were bright on these two stars here as both of them were trying to get things going. But I believe there's a, a swarming gloom veil coming through as well. Right. Yeah, the swarming gloom. There was a non-attack action was played from Arsenal. It had go again. They used the spellbound creepers, put the buying counter on the spellbound creepers, and were able to come in. Uh, so we are coming in. If it's a if it's a Mavering skies, that's also going to threat on hit to generate more rune chance, especially under the uh, Mav uh, the Mordred Tide. Um, but it doesn't matter what it is, really, because we have a Swarming Gloom Veil. We've generated more than 
uh, three auras this turn with all the rune chants that have been created. So this is going to be coming in for four go again. And if it hits, then you cannot prevent any of the arcane damage uh, for the rest of the turn. Uh, that's the on hit effect when you've made three or more auras this turn. So it looks like there's eight rune chants coming in. There's three rune chants that have been made and it's coming in for four with go again. And think- it looks like we're still floating two resources uh, which could be the Spellblade Assault, which is going to set you up for the next turn with having a bunch of rune chants as well. Or we could just see the two and two split come in uh, off the Rosetta, also sending whatever rune chants are left over. And this is where we're looking at the accounting. I think right now what Raymond's figuring out is not how to block, but how much damage could potentially come through. He sees the Spellblade Assault, like you mentioned. He sees what the Swarming Gloom Veil represents as well. And he's thinking, can I just tank... 21 damage here if my hand is the is the nuts if i have the truth here in my hand am i just going to absorb this and come back swinging like a champ i think that's where he's at right now and again this goes back to all those previous turns where Derek chu was not necessarily building that 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 you know house of cards too tall because he wasn't he didn't have the opportunity as raymond chow was really breathing down his neck the entire time and in this case four cards in hand that is the ideal that is the beautiful part about this if you got three elements it's fuse Pitch, swing, pitch, swing, and everyone's happy, right? So, and at three, it's going to take some creative accounting to be able to block this out. And if Raymond is holding, let's say, a red attack that he can go, maybe it's a red autumn's touch. Maybe it's uh, maybe it's uh, an, an oak and old. Who knows? But I think right now, it's not necessarily a matter of he's determining what card he wants to use to block right now. What he's doing is he's doing the math in his head and taking into account. Uh, and he is absolutely ready to go down to one if he's holding the truth. So we'll see how this goes. As you can see, he's really taking his time because this is potentially the decision that might determine how this goes. Because if he right. miscalculates, this could be dangerous. Right. And this, 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 you're not wrong. This is the go time of this matchup. So obviously we've gone into the OTK plan. Uh, we've set up as best we can. We've we, the, the light total swing has already happened. You're either going to have to commit to blocking and using the null rune protection from your boots that you can uh, to, or the arcane barrier on the null rune boots you can before this hits, or you have the Bravo activation in your hand and you just have to figure out how much damage can you force through. There is three block left on equipment currently um, for the Viscerai player. Plus a three block from hand. That means if he only comes in with a blue on hit, go again. Uh, it, it's not going to be enough. He's going to be able to block it out, but he's going to be on the back foot until uh, the game is over, essentially. The Viscerite player, that is. However, if he has a red in his hand that's going to come in for nine dominate, and he's only at three life, he's he's got lethal in his hand. Oh, here it comes. He's doing it. I think he just said, all right, uh, send me the bill in this case as he's going all the way down to 10 on that one attack. And now you're right. It is the Spellblade Assault. I don't think he can get there with the Rosetta Swing. So he's going to go with the Spellblade Assault. And like you mentioned, is just set it up for next turn. And look at all of those rune sheds that are coming in. And again, with the Mordor Tide and all that stuff, again, he's just kind of stocking the, uh, you know, the vault with more hate that might happen next turn. But I think I saw I saw Earth in uh, Raymond's hand. I did see a Guardian attack. That could be an Oakenold in there that he's holding on to. As uh, again, he's just doing the math he wants to make sure that this is clean and clear and there's no other tomfoolery that might occur here no rabbits out of the hat for Derek Chu essentially as he's this is that point Rick I think where when when you're you've got it in your hand you do the whole okay any action points any any floating pitch what's the story here do you have go again talk to me goose what do you got right And, and and tower just cleared you for the flyby so we're seeing the Crater Fist being set up to block the Spellblade Assault's physical part of the damage. He cannot stop the Arcane because the Swarming Gloom Veil hit and dealt damage. So that 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 three is definitely coming in. The Crater Fist is going out for the block, which is going to stop the two damage off the blue Spellblade Assault. The uh, and, and that, if I'm the Viscerai player, I am I am worried at this point that I am just dead because he took all that damage. Oh, and there boy. it is. There's the activation. What is the reveal? Nope, oh, nope. There. I mean, if it's a blue attack, but I mean, you're pitching the blue. Oh, it was the Oakenold. No, no, no. But it, all right. So there was no lightning. So he, he, he didn't 
activate Bravo. He's got the fuse. So this is a dominate coming in for nine. And he can only block six. So close yet so far, unfortunately, in this case is, yeah. uh, I mean, there you are. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Starvo, the star of the show and the star of the ProQuest at Manta. Again, Derek Chu, just a day late and a buck short on this one, ladies and gentlemen. So another win for Starvo, Rick. I don't think anyone's really surprised is this case. I mean, the OTK strategy is the line of play here. It just seemed like there was not enough juice uh, to be had. You, you could see that the Viscerai player was really struggling at times to really generate that stockpile of rune chance that ultimately would put the pressure on Starvo and force them on the back foot. It just wasn't enough. And I think Raymond did the right math in his head to just essentially just swallow the, the majority of that. Well, I think one one thing that was absolutely crucial there was that exposed elements early on and putting the damage counter on the Skeleta. And the reason why I say that is uh, the turn that um, you go off with Viscerai and you block with the Swarming Gloomvale, which is a card that you want to have in your hand, if you could have blocked with the Skeleta there, if you could have blocked with the Skeleta there, it's a completely different story at that point in time because you got another attack, you have more rune chance coming in and I don't think the math would have lined up. I think you would have had, and the Starvo seat would have had to have blocked. But unfortunately, at the beginning of the game, we saw a damage counter go onto that Skeleta. Now you you lose two armor block, period. And at any point in time in the game, when they're able to draw that exposed elements, they could just pop it. Uh, I think that the account was really strong for the Viscerai player. I think they played exceptionally well um waiting with patience to go off instead of trying to force it sooner they had a perfect sonata unfortunately the damage was something that could be tanked and still survive that was that's really what it boiled down to and if you're Derek Chu at that point you don't know if there's a, another uh, essentially another exposed to elements that's coming through. As you can see, the Raymond just basically popped that off in the first turn or two. And, uh, you know, that puts the pressure on you as the as the Viscerai player who might be worried uh, in terms of how long this game could go or how, how awry it could go should another exposed to the elements be drawn. Ultimately, it is Raymond Chow, the winner here at the ProQuest at Manta. So big thank you to everyone at Manta Games for hosting the event. It was a great, great event. Awesome people there. And uh, I want to shout out as well to Harry Tarantula for sponsoring the video. You go to uh, harryt.com. You can use the code FLAKE5 on your first order to get 5% off. And if you hate, if you just like the show, use the code FLAKE because that supports the show here as well. And Rick of BCW, thanks to BCW as well. BCW Supplies, use the code ISP10 on all of your orders. Get 10% off all of your orders. So uh, order lots and order often, friends. It's a great, 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 great company. Well, thank you very much for the kind words, and I'm just proud to be part of the Flesh and Blood community. Uh, personally, yes, I do work for them. I do like the products. I do promote the products, um, but I, I love the game. I love the community, and I love the opportunity. Thank you once again, Flake, and to everybody with the Instant Speed podcast for allowing me to come on and get to do a little bit of commentary work, something that I'm really passionate about. And again, it's always a pleasure to hang out and talk with you, and hopefully our commentary has brought some insight to some people. Damn right. All right, Rick. Well, thank you very much. And to everyone watching and listening, don't forget, you're not losing if you're learning. Keep playing the game, and you might win. We'll catch you next time, friends. Have a good one. <laughs>